Welcome, welcome. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Emma Porteous. I'm the executive producer of Situate Art in Festivals, and it is our great pleasure to welcome you here to this deep dive into regional festivals and what they mean for the cultural, social, and economic value of our communities. I want to begin by acknowledging that we are gathering today on the lands of the Palawa people. I want to pay my respects to Elders past, present and future and in particular I want to acknowledge that Launceston for millennia has been a meeting place for Palawa people. And I think it's important to just think about that before we dive into our kind of 21st century practice of gathering and meeting, which is festivals, that there has been, you know, 60,000 years plus of, of a culture of gathering and sharing and storytelling before us. I also want to acknowledge our, our Tasmanian Aboriginal colleagues who are in the room today. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Mr. Tra Travis Tiddy to kick us off. Thanks, uh, thanks, Emma. Uh, I'd also like to th welcome you all into the room here today. Is this? Can you hear me? Is this on? Yep. Great. Uh, so I'm the uh, artistic director of the Unconformity Festival. Some blatant self-promotion. We've just launched a program <laughs> last week, so you'll see some programs on your tables. Uh, and uh, as we evolve through this conversation here today. Uh, you know, we might, uh, uh, there's a uh, case study in front of you of a festival who is looking to address these, uh, these questions we're looking at uh, in the near, very near future. Uh, my backstory uh, is that I'm born and raised in Queenstown on the west coast of Tassie. Um, in 2010, I was involved in, uh, with a team of people in coming up with the concept of starting a festival. Uh, at the, the program launch last week and made the point, stressed the point that we had no idea what a festival was, how they were managed or how they operated. And it was quite a few long, hard, very hard years of volunteering on this festival and getting it off the ground into evolving into what it is today, which is that, that document that you, that you have before you. Um, one thing that's always been really important for us as a community-based festival in a place as unconventional as Queenstown, a mining town, to be hosting an ambitious contemporary arts event, is that we've been very values-based uh, since the beginning. That's been a, um, a guiding sort of thought process, and it still is. And you'll notice as we kick through today's conversation that uh, uh, understanding values, having a discussion about values, is going to be something that's important, uh, we feel, for the future of, of festivals. Um, uh, in terms of right now, the festival program... Sorry, I'm doing a bit of a, bit of a Go sell. For it. Go for it. <laughs> I, find it, I find it really difficult to sort of disentangle my own story from that of the unconformity. <laughs> but uh, uh, in terms of uh, right now, that festival program to us feels like a bit of a moment in time. It's 12 months late. Like many festivals, we postponed in, 20, in 20, uh, 2020. So it's been three years since our last event. And uh, we consider the... Come in. Jump on one of these four tables, table, if, you, yeah. if you can fit. Um, so we, it, it feels like to us we're delivering the third in a trilogy of festivals in a very set format that has been known and understood for quite a few years our urge is going to be to evolve because of need. Um, and I think you'll be seeing that, not only with us, but other festivals as well. That's part of today's conversation is what does that mean for the sector? What does that mean for those events? What does that mean for communities? And what does that mean for audiences? And what does that mean for artists who are at the heartbeat of our, uh, of our arts festivals? Um, thanks, that's my intro. Emma. Okay, I'm gonna give you my origin story now. Um, I want to share a little moment from uh, where I grew up, which is a tiny town called Smithton on the far northwest coast of Tassie. It's regional, not regional regional, as we discussed in our dance panel yesterday for those who were there. Remote. <laughs> or remote or regional or remote. Regional. Um, I kind of, I was born and bred in Smithton and, it, you know, as I was growing up there, I, I went through that that 
moment that every Tasmanian child has kind of going, this is not where I want to be, I want to escape. But I want to share a moment where that kind of pivoted for me. And it was through a really amazing arts experience that I had. Tim Newth from Trax Dance came to Smithton when I was 13 um, with Taz Dance and they made a massive participatory artwork that featured professional dancers and community and it was in the potato sheds of McCain's factory which I couldn't think of a more iconic kind of place-based space for a show in Smithton if you know the potato sheds of McCain's factory. Um, it had like a massive tree in the middle of it and the community could come up and write their wishes and dreams on the tree and kind of put them as leaves. Just remembering that this was 30 years before the Dark Mofo burning ceremony. Um, and then at the end of the, at the, end of the um, event, we picked up the tree and carried it to the Duck River and kind of put it on a barge, floated it down the river and set it on fire which is a very Tim Newth thing to do if you know Tim Newth from Tracks. Um, it was a moment where I kind of went, oh, Smithton's the place to be. It's a moment that connected me to a world outside um, the world I knew. It's a moment that connected me to professional artists and that it was a moment where I kind of went, oh, that's a thing, like making site-based, place-based, work with professionals and communities is a thing that's possible. And I think I share that story because that's what regional festivals do so very, very well. Um, and I thought it was a great place to start. Uh, the Situate program and the context that I'm bringing into the room today is that, um, is that of the independent artists I work with. So Situate works with regionally based independent artists from across Australia to make work for festivals. Um, and often we're, you know, particularly at the moment, we're exploring other contexts for presentation that sit outside festivals. Um, we also help the artists that we work with to build sustainable um, careers beyond their life in the program. So it's about kind of hooking them into a network that's going to feed them and support them um, in lots of ways for many years to come and help them build sustainable careers. I think you know, it's, it's no secret that it's a really tough time to be an artist at the moment and particularly an independent regionally based artist. And I want to share the kind of little glimmers of light that I see in what is a very dark kind of canvas um, as a way to set the scene and hopefully help guide the conversation today. The first is, I think, particularly in the last five years in Tasmania, there has been an incredible, urgent and necessary prioritisation of Tasmanian Aboriginal voices in our festivals and that has been phenomenal. It's some of the most exceptional work I've seen in festivals over the last couple of years and we need to keep doing it. I also provocate that as organisations we also need to keep looking at ways to decolonise our institutions and to make sure that it's not just festivals where that prior prioritisation happens. I think the hyper-local focus as well is a really interesting moment that we find ourselves in. Like we are literally one of the only states at the moment that can put on a festival and that can support our regional artists. And I think we're in the middle of a moment that can create a really amazing feedback loop that's positive and that continues to feed the grassroots of our arts ecology. Um, and the final thing I want to share is that we need to work across our organisations to make that happen for our artists. I've seen it, you know, through the Situate program, we work with festivals, we work with partners to kind of help create moments and I've seen that um, cross-sectorial approach propel people's careers to the next level. You know, nowhere else um, other than Launceston could Adele Varco, who presented Onesie World, have the premiere of that state on stage with the Violent Femmes in a onesie. You know, it's, it was an amazing moment and she went, <laughs> it really was, and she went on to replicate that work across Australia and internationally. It was pre-COVID. So, I think, you know, there is such potential to create this positive environment for our independent artists at the moment. Um, why are we here today? We really want to explore this notion of regional festivals. 
This is the beginning of several conversations that's going to happen across Australia. So we're going to focus on the Tasmanian context today, but if the conversation kind of goes outside of that, that's fine. At the end of today, we want to come up with a series of questions and provocations, and Regional Arts Australia is going to help us carry on that conversation with our national colleagues who can't be here today. Um, so I think that's really exciting too because the conversations that happen here are going to continue to happen over the next year, which is really important. So it's not the end at the end of today. Do you want to add some more to that context? Yeah, I, I would. Um, I want to acknowledge, I guess, the fact that we've got some really wonderful... I don't know everybody here, but those I do know, uh, we've got people who are involved with festivals in sort of core roles within the events. We've got artists in the room who produce, who develop work and produce for festivals. We've got the, uh, the people who run their own events, um, varying scales. We've got people in the room from the governance side of a festival, from a, from a board perspective. So that, they're the perspectives we wanna, want to harness as we, we go through this conversation today. Um, we have sneakily, uh, don't feel nervous if you see the butcher's paper on the, the table in front of you. We've got three questions that we want to address today. Um, because I think uh, the, the, probably the first one is understanding if there is a collective uh, feeling or desire that change is upon us within that specific space, within festivals. And if that's the case, we shouldn't probably be expecting our festivals to make that change without conversations and input and ideas from their constituency, from communities, from audiences and from the artists that they work with. The context that we're working within, and this is going to be very well understood by people in the room, but it needs to be brought to the table, is that uh, festivals that are an un undeniably uh, really important um, uh, part of the arts ecosystem. They, in, in many ways, maximise reach of, of artists' uh, uh, work, connecting with audiences. They mobilise audiences. They energise audiences. And they support the development of work. So they are a funding mechanism for artists as well. Uh, so we all, uh, I guess, we, under we understand, um, you know, those in the room here today for, you know, we're at Artlands <laughs> and Junction, which is a festival. We understand the role that festivals have. But uh, we are also in a period of time where these festivals are in an enduring lockdown sort of situation nationally. Uh, when we postponed the unconformity 12 months ago, we thought, 2021 will be great. Let's just bring it back. <laughs> and it's been just evolving through the year that, no, that's not the case. Tasmania, we're extremely fortunate. But our colleagues around the country are putting up their shutters. 2021 is a write-off for festivals around the country. And that's the impact of that is going to be felt, you know, not this year, but in years to come. That's serious. Uh, and, you know, that, that's true of our festivals, but uh, of, the, of the sector in the, in the country. So this return to normal in 2021 just has not happened. Uh, and we need to start considering, is this idea of returning to normal on, on the horizon? When does it come? And if it doesn't come, what do we do about it? Uh, the, the, for us, we consider um, the festival landscape as being extremely high risk and that's from a number of perspectives. Uh, festivals quite often, there are various, so many different festival models out there, but there is the uh, very common festival model of relying on ticket revenues to actually pay operationally for putting this, these events on. Sometimes that can be 30% or more of income. So if you reduce, if you create uncertainty around that revenue stream, uh, the uh, ability for festivals to move forward with continuity is really, really uh, risky. Uh, there's the audience safety aspect uh, at the moment, and you know we're seeing it through through this festival. There's so much, pl so many plans put in place to to really look after the safety of audiences. But I'd argue it's not only the safety of audiences at Artlands and Junction; it's the safety of people in Launceston as well through these events, um, and that has uh, a huge sort of resource and responsibility burden on these events. Uh, the ability for art, um, festivals to nurture artists and support the development of work when that could be yanked away from artists at any point in time 
um, through no fault of the festivals themselves or anybody, it's just the circumstance. Uh, that delivery mode is, is really unstable, that pre presentation mode of work. Uh, festivals working with partners. How do you secure partner support for an event that may be off the table in uh, one day, that afternoon, in two months' time? Uh, we are also in a really interesting moment in time where our governments are supporting events to postpone and come back to the table. How long will that last? Uh, that's an open question at the moment. And anyone here who is on a festival board, have a look through all those risk areas and think, you know, how is this moving forwards? What's the potential of this festival being taken off the table and us trading whilst insolvent? That's a conversation that's not understood by an audience when they're experiencing work, but they're all the layers of, of risk within the festival moment. And the provocation, I guess, is, uh, is this a moment in time at the moment? Is this going to change? Will it pass? Or do our festivals need to change? Do they need to be evolve? It's a pretty bleak context, I know. And we're here within a festival. Sorry to be a Debbie Downer, but uh, 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 we need to also address um, uh, you know, these challenges with, with an air of positivity because we do the arts sector, if it, if it does anything well, is to think laterally and overcome uh, these challenges uh, and problem solve. So we have three questions. Do you want me to go through this? Yes, and today is not all about us. Uh, we're going to get you guys on the tables that you're on to feed back to us uh, for some of the questions that we're going to Travis going to unveil now. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so uh, the way we've structured this is for some 15-minute opportunities to uh, address three questions. I'll go through them now. The first one, we felt it would be really instructive to have a discussion per table about the current festival model. Uh, there's, there's a variety of contexts that are out there. We've got re hyper-regional festivals, we've got statewide festivals, we've got big, big international festivals. All of those perspectives are of value because we're all in the same sort of situation. So what are the successes, what are the challenges for those festivals? And the urging that we would provide is that we have artists in the room, we have audiences, we have community p people who have viewpoints on community participation and engagement, and we've got operational considerations. So it's an open table. Uh, if we're to address the current festival landscape, what are the models and what are the successes and challenges of the current models that are out there? Question two, and we're not, we won't we'll go through these one at a time, is to have a conversation about the values behind festivals. What are they based on and why are values important? And I'll expand on that a little bit when we get to that question because we've got some thoughts to share. And then the third question is, should our festivals evolve and if so, how? And that's an open discussion. Uh, who knows what we might be dredged up you know, when we get to question three, but hopefully setting context and talking through the issues will lead to question three, providing some things that we can harness uh, in the context of this being the opening of a broader national conversation about the future of these events and the people who work upon them and the people who work for them. And the artists who make work in them. <laughs> All right, so let's recap question one. I think the format is we're going to give you 10 minutes on each table to provocate and to unpack and then you're going to nominate a table captain <laughs> to... Um, or we will. Or we will. So, you know, I suggest you do it yourself. <laughs> um, before we do that, I thought we were just going to whip around the room and quickly get a snapshot or maybe each table, introduce yourself to everybody on your table so that you know who you are and what your relationship to festivals is. And that might be multiple. You might be an artist, you might be an audience member of festivals or you might work for festivals. So just take a moment to um, intro yourself on your tables and then we will set you up with your questions. Can we also grab a couple of people from this table and move them to this table? <laughs> Thank you. All right. Has everybody done their intros? Are you ready to hear question one again? Can someone please be scribe for each table? Question one is, what are our current festival models? 
and what are their successes and challenges? You can consider the four focus areas, artists, audience, community participation, and operational considerations. That was a lot, wasn't it? <laughs> Did you get that? What? <laughs> what are our current festival models? What are their successes and challenges? And then if it's easy and you need a bit of help, you can think about it from um, the areas of artists, audiences, community participation and operational. If that's too much, just ignore it. All right, you've got 10 minutes and then we'll be getting each group to feedback. All right, I think we are going to stop that question discussion there and hand the mic over to you guys in a very COVID safe way and get you to feed back. Everyone's still speaking. A bit more assertive. <laughs> All right. Okay. Hey, who's the nominated person just to summarise some of those things that were discussed? Joel? <laughs> nice. All right. Um, there you go. Okay. Hi, I'm Joel. I live in Hobart. I do lots of musical things. Um, so we have a great team of... I've just... Oh, to sum it up, I hope a bomb doesn't fall in the building. There's such a wealth of knowledge and experience in here. I just thought it was good. So uh, do you want me to just run through our sheets? Great. Okay. So just talking about festival models and things, um, Mary named the elephant in the room, COVID, and how do we get the work out, as in um, onto shows. I think that's what you're meaning. Um, and we're talking about the local, as in Tasmanian, and moving artworks out into the rest of the nation or the world. Um, types of models like is it presented or self-presented as in you have a festival that pays artists versus um, a festival that might pay uh, – they might put it under their umbrella. So I know that Duck or the MoFos sometimes incorporate other things that they're not actually funding but they put it in their advertising, for example. And then you have hybrid versions of those things. And I know because uh, of my personal contacts that some of the councils are moving towards the – um, more of providing an umbrella. City of Hobart supports Vibrant's um, Street Art Festival, but they don't actually get involved, they, but they provide uh, support. Um, a place-based versus a thematic model, so unconformity seemed to be the stereotypical place-based one, um, versus something like the Taste in Hobart, which you could put on in any city in Australia at any time. And to some extent, the Signet Folk Festival, I mean, it's beautiful there, but you could actually have an Oatlands Folk Festival in much the same way. Um, we're talking about participation, bums on seats, local impact and bringing in, um, what have we got, fly in, fly out type arts practitioners. Um, we're just talking about the audience, who is the audience in that case. I can't remember what the details were on that. Uh, we talked about challenges. Um, I think Sam summed this up really well, managing a variety of stakeholders. So we were start, starting to quab, quibble over in Hobart, um, as a Hobartian, but not a local. Um, I feel like Dark Mofo's left the locals behind. We feel like, you know, there's, it's more about bringing in a whole audience from out of the state or out of the city. And, you know, there's different levels of whether the art makers are local versus um, being brought in. Um, the challenge is uh, how do you keep audiences local? Like, um, I don't feel engaged by any of the mo mofos anymore, but I'm really interested in unconformity because I find, I know there's an authentic authenticity that draws me there, for example. Um, challenges of ticket access and accommodation. So, poor old Queenstown copped it that, you know, um, getting accommodation there. But I also find, as someone on low income, getting a ticket to events in the mofos is... I, I don't go to much. I get to see things when I work as a driver and I get a ticket to go into things as a result of that. Um, local em employment versus bringing in outsiders, that's sort of we talked about before. Um, and 
Edith um, talked about local collaboration during lockdown. She's finding it quite rich at the moment because it's forcing her to look at the resources available around her. But she's also mindful that that'll have an expiry date. There'll be a point where we need to get out and bring in other talent and, you know, for each of us to grow by the experiences we have out in the rest of the world. Is it right for me to rave on more? Yep, right. Shut me up when you like. Opportunities. Uh, first, there's an opportunity for festivals, each of the festivals, to work together to create different models so that we're not just doing the same thing. Um, um, Mary talked about time frames, like in Italy, that there's a number of regional festivals that lead up to a big sort of event. Um, you know, we're thinking sort of as, as a whole state, and we're sort of talking about seasons of making and seasons of presenting and this sort of thing. Um, and I didn't quite... I've written an extended notion of festival engagement. So I think that's, again, audiences and artists, you know, there are opportunities to do things in there. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was an, it seemed like an, an incredibly rich conversation. Um, I really love that idea of different models. I just want to kind of, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind, particularly for question three, when we get to that, that point, because I think that's what we're going to be talking about there. All right, next table. Uh, can I also add, I think it's also, it is on the table to be discussing some of the inherent sort of faults and weaknesses and some of the things with festivals that have, you may perceive have, you know, may have been an enduring sort of issue that needs to be fixed. I think the, the room would appreciate that sort of uh, level of bringing that to light and talking those issues through. Hello. I'm Fiona, and so uh, the man, sorry, Joel. Joel mentioned all the models that we actually talked about, and I suppose we just added that normally when there's a festival, there's a networking opportunity like this that might be attached to that festival or APAM or other things that are happening as well. So we actually thought that that was a good model to create those networking spaces. And we talked about um, the thematics of a festival. So, you know, whether they're site specific or they have a certain cultural aspect or a theme around how that festival is produced. And so um, the successes of the festival, um, Paul talked about a really, uh, something that happened at the Perth Festival where they actually were subsidised to move the festival because of COVID. And he thought that that was a really amazing um, managerial agility to be able to keep that festival going and support those artists and to keep happening. And um, so uh, Dark Mofo, um, that it has developed its own identity. So different festivals are starting to really shape and create, I suppose, a thematic um, within that festival. And uh, just the transition during COVID um, to outdoor venues to be able to um, maintain that 1.5 social distancing that's required. And then obviously there's been a lot of support um, for that kind of stuff to happen. And then we talked about um, now there's so much accessibility online in the digital world because you can see everything from all over the world. And then the challenges of that um, with the digital technology was that we felt like there was a missing human connection because we uh, are hardwired. we're hardwired to sit with other people and build empathy amongst um, our fellow human beings and that was missed in the digital world which then meant that we were lacking um, you know human connection which then leads into mental health issues and all that isolation stuff um, and the challenges obviously are you know being able to deliver those festivals um, amongst the government regulations and how quickly they change so thank you amazing that was great thank you next group who's uh, feeding back who's the Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Vernon. Um, we really started our discussion around place and kind of um, what that means in terms of exposure and access, but also um, kind of celebrating a place and its people. Um, we then kind of headed on to, in fact, a kind of a fourth area, not necessarily a model that kind of cuts across and is certainly 
a, a big emergence at the moment. We're talking about this kind of tourism-funded and tourism KPI-style cultural events and what that means for those kind of three different styles of hyperlocal, international and, and kind of place-based as well. Um, what else did we say here? Uh, a t looking at a top-down approach from primary industry and government relationships. Um, and uh, looking at, um, you know, what festivals are done for the profile of Tasmania and how that's kind of changed a lot and where to from there, you know, where, where do we go now with that? Um, and have I missed something here? Sorry. It's a great flow chart. <laughs> <laughs> I think we only got onto the strengths. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we, 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 we were quite good at avoiding bad things. Yeah. How diplomatic of you all. <laughs> the challenge is, yeah, through both for COVID but also kind of finance of this growth of kind of local, you know, festivals and so on, not having the resources as well to, to access that international work. Um, yeah, did I miss anything else? Uh, the, one of the great successes was talking about of festivals was the um, uh, that festivals are incredible at prototyping um, new new spaces, new ideas, and, and ways to engage with people. And I was suggesting that that, in my experience, comes from two things. One, festivals are extraordinary at pulling money together from different sources compared to institutes and and individual arts organisations. But um, because of brand and I'm sure the values conversation we're about to have as well, that uh, audiences have an immense amount of trust in a lot of festivals and with that comes the trust to take, you know, for artists to take risks and audience to take risks with those artists. So that's really an interesting thing around prototyping. Mm, I love that idea of prototyping. I've been thinking about a lot lately how we can um, create models to show work in progress and create... Uh, avenues for artists to present work that's not finished as well, particularly at the moment when we're seeing so many festivals cancelled and so many artists have a backlog of work that needs presenting. I just think there's a really interesting conversation to be had there, uh, perhaps in question three. Thank you. I'm going to have to do a weird swivel thing like this, I think. Um, I, I've, I guess I'll keep it fairly short because I don't think there's a lot that hasn't been covered that we talked about. Um, yeah, we sort of came up with a, a number of like dichotomies of um, of models: the sort of international arts festival versus the hyperlocal, the place-based, site-specific versus um, you know multi-location, um, one day versus multi-day. Um, I think. Um, one thing we were discussing, um, you know, and I've seen it in many places I've lived, is the sort of uh, bigger state-based or international-focused arts festival um, and the inevitable kind of um, grind with the local community, arts community, that can come from feeling uh, locked out of that. Um, and then, you know, now what's with COVID, you know, we're seeing... Um, a lot of those festivals, if they can return to the hyperlocal, and, and there's a wonder in that, um, but just being wary of of fostering that divide and that dichotomy, and kind of allowing space for, um, you know, different artworks to come from all over different places, but needing to constantly acknowledge that you know we, we need to foster the local um, community as well, and I think you know that's just a kind of consistent challenge that comes up. Um, we talked about the sort of grassroots um, c festivals that might come stem from community involvement, community driven versus, um, you know, programmed by whatever artistic curators or whatever. Um, anything else? Volunteers. Volunteers. I think um, it's a <coughs> this is really important conversations. I'll just say that because um, I'm sitting at a table with people who are developing and, and starting very small grassroots 
um, festivals in, um, you know, uh, not in cities, in small regions. So I've just been sitting here listening to people, you know, and engaging with people I haven't met before. Um, and that's, um, I'd be interesting to see in, you know, 10 years what the, their conversations would be. Um, and, you know, with Travis's work in Queenstown um, and where that uh, has grown and to be mindful of where you start and where you're going and where the climate is and where you're heading um, to, um, to just be mindful because you're starting something, if it's place-based, you're starting something with a community. Um, and then if you start to think we need international to make it stronger and, and all of those conversations that should grow organically, um, it's, it's an, I find it an interesting thing where there might be people in other spaces deciding what's happening in your space. So, um, uh, you know, so to, to keep things place-based, place if that's what it is, it was good when you said you could move, you know, Signet to, to Oatlands. Um, I don't know how Signet would feel, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But I, I understand what you're saying. And I think, you know, look, everybody, everybody, I feel, you know, the digital world and the space we're in, we're trying to navigate how do we, you know, um, empower, capacity build and showcase our arts and culture um, where we are to the rest of the world um, and, and ourselves and, and, and grow ourselves on this journey. And I think the festivals are really, really important. And for ones to want to be starting up festivals, it's an interesting conversation is why, what do we, what do you want from, from with, what are your dreams in building a festival in your area and where would that go and, and looking back, what's that journey? It's, yeah, so this legacy secessioning, there's a whole lot of stuff, capacity building, mentoring, um, you know, in the, in the end of it for me personally, it's, it, it's, um, there's a lot about capacity building and, and, and you know, building healthy, strong communities. And we, we, we can do that through arts and culture and gathering people together. The restrictions through COVID and the digital space um, is something we need to navigate. We don't know the next turn as it happens, um, but watching the festivals and the resilience of our arts and culture and just that brief conversation with Travis, we will get there. We, we will work away of engaging people through arts and culture. And if it's gotta be some digital, some personal, um, you know you know what I'm like, outdoors is best, we can have more people. So let's maybe move them into seasons where we can be outdoor more than indoor. That's one thing I find interesting with Tasmania is we have a lot of festivals in, in, and it's raining or it's freezing. <laughs> normal. I know it's normal, but you know. Thanks so much for that, Dave. And I also think in Tasmania, we have a lot of arts organisations that work site responsively, um, like way more than uh, many other states in Australia. And I think that's really interesting as well. That's such a great segue um, into our second question, which is about values, that idea of being mindful um, and remembering always the grassroots. So thank you very much. Trav? Yes. <laughs> seasonal release of uh, or a seasonal presentation cycle it's it's a really interesting idea thanks table table Joel um, he loves your seasonal presentation that that conversation just now was really just to get things moving and to talk about the sector talk about festivals successes and challenges really interesting that digital came up towards the end of that conversation because it is something that uh, festivals are really facing, how to communicate with audiences that can't physically be there with you in the room. Uh, and just for context, um, we are recording this session, so there will be, uh, you will be able to access this information afterwards um, in some sort of form because there's a lot of really rich uh, conversations floating around the room. The question two is around values and uh, anybody who's been involved in an organisation knows that when you do your strategic planning session all weekend <laughs> and you get to that question of values and you reset, you reorder your values, you talk about what is important for you as a group of people, as an organisation, as a community, and they're foundational. You use them within your strategic planning framework, you communicate them to funding bodies, you talk about them when you have a code of conduct policy, they flow through an organisation. Uh, those values, are they still the same in an era when we're grappling with forces that are beyond our control? Do we have to think differently about a set of values that guide who we are and what we do? As a festival, uh, 
festivals are very dominant entities in a sense within the artistic sector. They control a lot of mechanisms for artists to to uh, uh, to reach an audience. And you know there could be a conversation about the power structures within festivals and how that work they work and whether there is the genuine opportunity for shared thinking and shared discussion and shared decision making. Um, so we thought it could be really helpful to loop back towards values and what are the values that should underpin um, our festivals. Uh, what should they be based on and why are they important? And if it, if it is helpful, we can look at, again, those four uh, focus areas of artists, values around artists and working with artists and audiences, values around working with community, diversity, working with First Nations uh, people, and then operational considerations around that. I, I think there, anybody who's been in the festival game knows that there's a, quite often a human toll in putting on these festivals. The, uh, the, cultural, the shiny cultural problems often uh, really uh, hide a lot of um, uh, 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 working, working environments that are really challenging to make these happen and they take a toll. So that's also a consideration when we think about values. So what values should our festivals be based upon and why are they important? And to give you a case study uh, or an example about why this sort of discussion, you know, where this can be uh, helpful within organisations or for individuals. We went through a process in 2020 as the Unconformity where we spoke to a lot of artists and we reset some thinking around values and we called it our UnCOVID-19 uh, cultural framework and uh, they created uh, a set of five values that we thought were reorienting our focus areas amidst uh, a completely unpredictable sort of global environment. And then we had a matrix which risked every single program that we run against those five values so we could see whether what we were doing still matched those things that we felt were important. And we shared that with artists and we shared that with funding bodies and that feeds into every single documentation that we create. So that's why this sort of conversation is important. It can really help to sort of focus an entire organisation. I'm speaking for a little bit too much, but let's, let's get to that question. <laughs> you want me to give you the answers? <laughs> Uh, I've got a copy of the document here. If anybody wants to... Sure. No, you're right, you don't. Uh, I've got a copy of that document here if anybody wants to read it. <laughs> He's not giving away any answers. <laughs> so, does everyone... Is everyone clear on that question and the discussion to be had? Great. What values should our festivals be based on and why are they important? You've got a quick 10 minutes for this one and then we're going to have five minutes of feedback. Okay, thanks everybody. We're going to uh, push on so we don't run out of time. Uh, we're going to start with this table again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, moving on. We'll start with this table and we'll talk about values and why they're important in a festival context. You're the man. Um, so people... People come up as the most important value in lots of ways. And one of our members talked about running a unit called Don't Be an Asshole, which um, I, I think is a really basic thing. Um, I mean, you know, it's sort of, it's sort of obvious, though, you know, isn't it? You're building a community. Uh, maybe. But um, I think that's a good basic principle. Um, anyway, sorry, I won't digress. Um, People are the centre where you have cooperation, decency, kindness and openness. Um, a festival is a celebration. So there's, there's a power in bringing people together. And the power in different ways. So there's a power that an energy is created. But you also have a power of manipulation and abuse if that's not managed carefully. So we're talking about not abusing that power. Um, we talked about the festivals in what they do connect artists and audiences beyond the whole professional thing, like I said, you know, it's not, you, you don't just mean 
you know, I get money for doing art and you guys come along and have a night out. But it's actually, it's a genuine sort of thing. Mm, safety was a big theme for us. A, a sense of safety in, in, in lawfulness and cultural space, that you'd personally feel safe, that staff would feel safe, that people of different classes or genders or other groups that I can't even think of would feel safe to go. Um, I'm not sure what that one's about. And we talked about, you know, when you're talking about goals, are we talking about our personal goals? Like, you know, we're talking about festivals that there should be a freedom for people to create festivals that none of us would want to go, you know, like we're talking about car crashing festivals. I'm sorry to offend people who are into crashing cars, but, but that's, that's a legitimate thing for a whole lot of people. Yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not my thing. And they would have a whole lot of values... And I think that's that's a value of like being an arts person and and not just going into a town and going oh yeah you you guys are all bogan so we're going to have a you know beer drinking festival or, or you know that's another respect thing and we talked about you know so Launceston had a blockies festival and I know that the unconformity had a muster you muster and someone Let's was talking talk about that one yeah okay <laughs> someone was talking from Daniloquin on the telly screen this morning I remember I know they have a massive like you know, Bachelor and Spinster's Bowl, for example. I'm just talking about things that are not part of our my values or the, my immediate community. And um, we talked about competing values that I think Sam was talking about, sort of inevitable that you're going to have competing values. And one of the things we came up is that actually um, festivals might have actually quite different values based on, you know, what those things are about, which I mm. just sort of opened another whole mm. realm. Fantastic. I, I guess the, the reason we're here is because we're talking about arts festivals and that's not, you know, we need to acknowledge that there are a, such a diverse range of festivals and coming together sort of events. Um, and we do have a project in our festival this year called Collision, but uh, that's a Taz dance. That's a Taz dance. And we piece. have another project called Seed, which is made of crushed cars. So, you know, that's a situate work. So you're not far from, you know. <laughs> <laughs> One of the key things I really like is that acknowledgement that there might be competing values. So the values that an artist holds in that pure creation of work and trying to reach an audience may feel misaligned with the values and the needs of a festival and their, their objectives and how does that, how do they sit together. Table two. I'm back. <laughs> So um, we talked about values in relationship to more of abstract. So looking at, or, you know, the individual, so authenticity, um, the community outcomes, having ethical leadership and being integrity, like having integrity, honesty and supportive in your decision making um, and building those connections amongst the festival and the community and what kind of ideology that creates and the environment that that creates amongst the people and how we interact and build our social relationships. And, um, but also within that, I suppose that having integrity um, through your provocation and using um, art places to make uh, disruptive, challenging works. Am I saying the right thing here? <laughs> Good. All right, I got support from my team. Um, and that translates through... <laughs> I went rogue before and they were like, you can explain this to everyone else. And I was like, oh. <laughs> um, translate that into an engagement um, through the discourse and how we relate to other people um, and how that then shapes our cultural identity through diversity, and through by taking, um, being courageous and taking risks and finding balance. balance. <laughs> <laughs> so to, to uh, reinforce, we are documenting these words. So thanks, thanks for those, uh, that eloquent sort of wrap up then. <laughs> uh, uh, in a similar way, we kind of broke things into categories rather than specific values, so areas of, of values. Um, so one was around kind of clarity, so clarity of audience, clarity of who you're talking to, your, art, your artists. Um, distinction, so, you know, what, what makes you distinctive? Is it place or these other things that we're discussing? Um, creative risk was a, 
a great addition <laughs> at the last minute in terms of um, creating a space for, for risk in terms of going back to the point before around you know safe places for artists to make and share work but a safe place for audiences and we talked a lot about this bigger category of safety um, and Wendy led us off there and it cascaded into a whole bunch of areas around um, everything from physical safety which is you know very topical at the moment um, through to uh, creative safety, through to cultural safety, through to the bigger discussions of decolonising these systems. And so there was a lot in safety and the responsibilities that come with that um, around diversity of your audience and um, access in its broadest definition. Um, there was a lot in that one. Uh, and the diversity of artists. Um, did I miss anything else? No, I think, yeah, definitely, and I appreciate Table 1's kind of discussion around safety and kind of how broad that is in terms of connecting to the core values for both artists and audience was, was a lot of where we kind of talked around. Mm. Uh, and I guess especially if as an arts organisation or as an artist or a festival you are on the more experimental side and you like to sort of sit on the edge of, of certain disciplines and really um, create those new experiences for for audiences, cultural safety in that sort of context is also, I would have thought, important. Table four. Um, we went really deep on one value for most of our time. Um, so we, <laughs> we had a really um, impassioned conversation about fair pay for fair work. Um, and mostly looking at that as a sort of issue of government subsidy, I suppose. I feel like maybe you would articulate this better than I would. Yeah, yeah. Am we allowed to use the same microphone or will we get wiped out? Um, okay, so I got on my soapbox, I have to admit. and uh, But it's fair work for fair pay or fair pay for fair work. And... Um, the issue being that we in Tasmania have a history of paying six-figure fees to imported artists for festivals and offering meal deals to local artists. And that we acknowledge that um, artists, art, uh, being a professional artist is a professional thing. People train for, you know, six years, ten years to become specialists. Um, they, uh, they deserve to be paid um, appropriately for their work as thought leaders in the community. And that festivals are a key um, event on a professional artist's annual calendar of work. Um, they, they're gigging, they're in the gig economy. Um, so uh, a festival is a time when you would expect that you should be able to get a gig that you got paid for. Um, but unfortunately, it's all too often not the case. Um, we also talked about the public value. Um, so uh, that artists shouldn't be paid just because they're artists or just because it's a festival. They should be paid because they are providing public value and that public money should go into public value. So it's not a simple thing of, oh, well, I deserve to get money from the government because I'm an artist. It's... The work I do represents public value and that's what public money is for. Mm. Really, really glad that uh, that was raised um, yeah, on, by table four. And I guess there's, in terms of value, this is a different sort of aspect to the, the concept of value, but uh, in Tasmania, our arts festivals are funded through economic value that they create for communities of people. So, uh, you know, that is a type of chameleon-like sort of uh, shifting of language um, in order to fit those criteria and actually fund these organisations in the first place, which has its own tensions and uh, probably should be a focus areas for our festivals when we talk to our, our funding stakeholders. Question three, our final question, and we've left the least amount of time to discuss it. So, you know, I was thinking maybe uh, 
I'll tell you the question and maybe each table has like one big kind of point to make, right? Just to kind of focus the conversation and to put the pressure on you. Should our festivals evolve and if so, how? So given all of that discussion that we've had today, what do you think are the most pertinent points that are going to drive the evolution of, of festivals and why do we need to do it? You have five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are going to start wrapping things up. We're going to go the other way this time. I know, I know. An hour and a half is not enough. And this is, this is not a deep dive. This is a very shallow dive. Table, table I, four. Okay. Um, we, sorry, I'm not... Um, <laughs> we, we had just talked a little bit about what the situation that we're in in terms of COVID, and I just made this analogy that with COVID, what we have noticed in terms of our personal safety is that we're safe in our physical locality. I don't feel threatened by people having COVID in Melbourne. I would feel threatened if somebody in this room had COVID. And that's brought up this, this new sense of investment and interest and participation in the environment directly around us. The air we breathe, the earth under, underneath our feet, those kind of values that are not just hyper-local or a new regionalism, it's actually based on being where you are and with the people you're there with. And those values are becoming um, not just that they need to be in a rural-based environment, that's whatever city you're in, whatever locality you're in. Um, and I think that is a new way forward for a lot of people, whether that's in festivals or that's in communities. Um, so I can see how small communities can do very well with their own festival, which is based upon the assets and the strengths of that community. And it's a beautiful way forward. And then we talked about that in relationship to, but we don't want to get so um, that we're just based, uh, yeah, that we're just inward looking and that we're not um, extending ourselves out to an international audience or, 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 or what have you. But I still think that most communities actually have the connections. We just haven't, mining isn't the right word, but we haven't just made, we haven't, we just don't know our communities well enough to know their strengths. And that from where we are, we can actually do it everywhere and run. Um, what those things do is they bring people together in a particular way that builds the strength and the resilience that we need to go forward, not just in terms of COVID, but in terms of climate change. Mm. And we, we, it's, a, it's a need, and I think we need to respond to it. And mm. festivals are a good way of growing that in community. It's a bit long, sorry. Uh, I guess that speaks to a, a deeper sort of need for the festivals beyond spectacle. Know, beyond, beyond entertainment, there's something deeper. And I guess in a, in a situation where we talk about hyperlocal and place-based a lot, that's a word that's spoken about a lot, understanding what that means. And I think you said it so eloquently, knowing who you are, knowing where you are is, is important. Um, I think in the short amount of time, we just started on some interesting ideas and disagreements and <laughs> didn't resolve to any particular point. <laughs> however, 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 um, we did talk about, uh, we had, there was a diversity of opinions around whether festivals and the funding models for festivals were sustainable. Some believed it's completely unsustainable and has to change. Others felt that this was perhaps an extraordinary time for festivals in terms of the level of government funding going into festivals in terms of a post-COVID world. But we all agreed that that money is not moving down to where it's needed, either fast enough or at all through postponements, and that's to artists, which led us uh, on to, you know, a universal basic income. And, of course, that's really where the conversation uh, started to get exciting. And... Because uh, <laughs> uh, I think at that point, you know, if, if that was the case... What, what is the purpose of festivals then? And that's a very different conversation and it leads to the points around hyperlocal and, and what 
those kind of what structures are needed to deli to deliver successfully, you know, engaged and hyperlocal uh, artworks and you know support cohesive communities. But we didn't really get a chance to get into that. Is there anything else on the? I love how it's just all been crossed out. <laughs> uh, it probably reveals that there's no one set sort of set of ideas or pathways forward, and mm. the diversity of. Uh, Sorry, are you still? No, is there anything else? I was dropping in with my summary. <laughs> so universal basic in income, um, UBI sort of sounds like a sexually tr transmitted disease, but we should be talking about UBI. Uh, uh. <laughs> just adding to the, the idea of festivals being um, more than just a place of spectacle but I think at the moment with the COVID stuff there's a whole bunch of like civil liberty stuff that's important to address um, the, the the privacy issues uh, the fact that there's a loss of lot loss of privacy through um, social media and all that kind of stuff the fact that we're relying on social media for connection and we've lost privacy through that at the same time how do you how do you get intimacy when you've got no privacy um, in your main form of communication at a time when you're forced to communicate that way. Mm. There's a whole bunch of stuff that we, that we need to address and festivals can, can do that. Thank you. We've got three minutes. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Hi, okay, three minutes. So one and a half minutes for us and one, for, anyway. I don't know what it is, but I'll go Five quick. Five minutes for us. Okay. Um, so, we really talked about uh, leadership and the evolution of leadership in festivals. Um, I, I guess particularly because I think the answer to should festivals evolve being of course they should. Um, otherwise they become stagnant and irrelevant and festivals can lead communities and they can lead conversations and they have this really great power to do that. But the only way to make sure they do that is through the evolution of the festivals and, you know, that continuing process. And leadership of festivals is a very important part of that. And in particular, we were talking about how uh, uh, festivals have kind of gone from a place where you'd have a festival leader or director for many, many years and now it's down to, you know, four, maybe five years. And that's a really important thing that there's new blood and changing in ways of doing things within festivals um, to ensure that they keep pushing boundaries. Um, and in particular, we talked about, um, um, you know, we're, we're at a stage where there is more affirmative action in festivals and it's important that that evolves um, and so that people are now involved in festivals that wouldn't have been many years ago, First Nations artists and curators and the LGBTQIA plus community um, will go into leadership uh, positions in the future and that's such an important evolution for festivals. Yeah, I think what we... Hello. Um, so, and then from that, there's been this leadership, but then also those boxes that categorise people that in the future that those boxes don't exist anymore and that everyone is b being able to participate. So we're not categorising people, which makes an exclusion. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so our ideas are all fit together so it was about time factors so the fact that in the opportunity of the COVID time has made time frames for building work and festivals um, to enlarge which is um, enabled you know um, I don't know greater development um, uh, to build what have I got here to build sort of community involvement and audi audience participation sharing of expertise so we're talking about you know like an artist or a corporation going into a community and sharing their thing over a longer period of time to build it up um, and we sort of tied that together with the time factor enabling like you know should festivals invest in new commission work versus known successes or in music I know we call it the canon um, and Sam was a strong advocate for the, despite the risks it's a better investment to invest in new work in and I sort of backed that up by saying, 
I feel so much. It's really important to support living artists, you know, as a composer or a playwright or, you know, it's actually much more important that that money ends up in the pockets of the living. Um, and we talked about a, a knockdown effect um, um, uh, that that might have. Anyway, I just as a personal anecdote, my partner Jude Abel did a residency in Queenstown, I think about 2010, and that's affected us as a family in the most extraordinary way over that time. Like, she built relationships. She un she grew up in the northwest, but she never understood that region. You know, she got a relationship with you. Um, yeah, so it's that sort of model of of a long term effect, um, but certainly that festivals should evolve. Mm. Okay, uh, wrapping this up with zero minutes remaining. Uh, some, of the, some of the points that have come out uh, around leadership within festivals, I think whilst there's a desire for more input and more conversation with festivals, there's also an expectation of leadership from them as well. Picked up on the desire for festivals to work together as well you know, that competing priorities that festivals sometimes have was something that was raised. I, I come back to, and something that Dave reinforced, was that seasonal idea because that suggests something that is remodelling the presentation, uh, if that's a time sort of shift, if that's a, a remodelling the way in which an audience engages with work and to be able to afford a little bit more flexibility in the development and then the presentation of that work is something that I picked up from, from that suggestion. Um, I'm really curious about the, the relatively lack of conversation around digital. Um, there's a lot of chatter about that at the moment, but when we centred upon the, the concept of play space and knowing where you are, I guess the ubiquitous nature of the online world sort of competes with that somewhat. So how, do, how are those things reconciled is really interesting. Um, a final point from me before Emma sort of suggests where this conversation goes next is that we've got a lot of really important people in the room uh, from the festival world, our artists, <laughs> um, no joke, uh, artists, we, we really need that, this input, that somebody who works on a festival, we really want that, these sort of discussions put on the table, sometimes they're uncomfortable, but I think it's, it's really important that this is a discussion point that doesn't end in this sort of context, that it goes further beyond this, this room. We also have some key people involved with festivals in the room, so uh, I would suggest that they would be highly interested in these ideas and thoughts and, and for taking these conversations forward as well. Yeah, thank you for being our guinea pigs today. I think if we were to do it again, we would definitely leave less time for that first question and more time for the last question. Um, we are hoping, uh, I don't yet know what the national conversation is going to look like. I'm going to let Regional Arts Australia get through this conference and then we'll have that discussion. It is my great hope and I will push for um, the ability for you guys to be involved in that national discussion so it's not siloed uh, across the country, that we are in fact having it together. What that looks like, I don't know yet, but please stay connected uh, to the festival because the Regional Arts Australia conference because that's how we will disseminate that information. Thank you so much for today. It's been incredibly rich. Have a wonderful rest of your conference and junction. And we're going to do a group photo over here if you feel like you want it and you don't want to rush off to afternoon tea straight away. Thank you.